In this year falls the centenary of the death of Sir Walter Scott. The man himself, the born and learned who had a kindliness for all men, and who lived so full and varied a life, is a figure that many of us delight to contemplate. Like Dr. Johnson, and unlike most men of letters, he does not live for us only in his books. We think of him as we think of famous men of action, as a living and breathing human being, and not a dim shade from the library. He has left us not only the products of his fancy, but almost his bodily presence, a personality which to his lovers is as real as if in the flesh he still moved among us. Lord Byron, who didn't praise lightly, thought him as nearly a thorough good man as a man can be. When he was 55, and already in failing health. He had to face a financial crash and found himself cumbered with a mountain of debt. He refused to take the easy refuge of bankruptcy. He set himself to pay off every penny. He succeeded, but he died of it. The last years of Scott provide one of the few heroic episodes in the careers of men of letters. But a writer lives by his books, and in the few words I am going to say to you, I want to deal with Scott as a writer, for in that lies his chief claim to remembrance. He had an immense popularity in his own day, and an immense influence all over the world. Some of the greatest of his successors in France and Germany and Russia drew their inspiration from him. But fashion changes in literature, as in other things. And the tide of fashion seems likely to have been moving away from Walter Scott, though he has always had a band of stalwart devotees. That matters little, for he's beyond the ebb and flow of fashion, and the world must return to him. Let me quote two of the judgments of his peers. Barn wrote to him, I would ask, as Bothwell did of Johnson, of whom could you be jealous? Of none of the living, certainly, and taking all and all into consideration, of which of the dead? Goethe, when in his old age he reread Waverley, said that he was constrained to place it alongside the best things that have ever been written in the world. The judgment of such men is not to be lightly disregarded. His fame must rest principally on his novels. Now a novel is simply the world as seen through the temperament of the novelist. And its success depends upon the depth of his insight and the richness of his temperament, upon the two powers of perception and interpretation. So there are three tests to be applied. First, his competence as a student of human character. Second, the skill with which he presents his conclusion. And lastly, his power of transforming his world, the stellar and undiminishable something, which was Emerson's definition of greatness. First, for his characters. We may pass by so-called heroes and heroines. They are mostly conventional figures, on which he expended very little pains. One of them he himself described as a sneaking piece of imbecility. They play the part of a Greek chorus and repeat all the accepted platitudes and keep a drama which might otherwise be too fantastic within reach of our prosaic life. About his real characters, the first thing to be noted is that he draws them from a very wide area far wider than most novelists, for he was limited to no one social grade, no one enclave of space of time, and almost alone among British novelists, he was at home both in the city and in the country. His limitations are chiefly two. He was not very successful with his younger women, except Diana Vernon, women of his own class, that is, but the criticism is not true of his presence.
and he did not attempt figures of profound intellectual or moral subtlety. His interest was in what the Greek philosopher called the main march of the human affections. The second thing to be said is that he always shows his figures in relation to their environment. He was acutely interested in the way in which men conducted their lives, and no novelist has painted in more convincingly the social and economic background. He anticipated Balzac in showing the close interlocking of human lives. His best character drawing is in his Scottish novels, and perhaps only a Scotsman can fully appreciate his complete fidelity to life. Yet his great figures are independent of space or time, as universal as the creations of Shakespeare and Moliere. I need only cite Danny Dinman and David Dean and Bailey Nickel Jarvie and Andrew Fairservice and E.B. Ochiltree among his men and among his women Meg Medellis, G.D. Dean, Meg Dodds and the witch wives in the Bride of Lammermoor. To turn to the novelist's second task, Scott expounds his characters principally through speech and action. He does not provide, like some other writers, pages of laborious analysis. The structure of the novel is often defective, for he was sometimes in too great a hurry to get on with his story and scamped the explanatory pause. You see, he was always telling himself stories. His plots were not laboriously hammered out. They built themselves up in his brain while he was at his work at court or riding among the hills. There is a good deal of padding, too, but his memory was so full of knowledge that he was averse to discarding what interested himself. But when the great moments come, he never fumbled. Then the narrative quickens so that there is not one unnecessary word and we are in the grip of overmastering drama. Few writers can so cunningly darken the stage and make the figures seem no longer men and women, but puppets moving under the hand of some eternal destiny. I need only cite such scenes as the death of Fergus MacIver in Waverley, the meeting of Meg Menelis and the Laird of Helen Gowan in Guy Mannering, the scene at the Clachan of Aberfoyle in Rob Roy, the great scene between Jeannie Deans and Queen Carolyn in the heart of Midlovian, and the final scene on the beach in Red Comte. One thing is worth noting, Scott's gift of cunning anticlimax. He always permits the breaking in of a voice from the common world, which does not weaken the heroic, but brings it home. Alec Polworth, after Fergus MacIver's death, brings us to earth with the information about which gate his head will be fixed on. The grave digger Mortchuch in the Bride of Lammermoor has his petty grumble among the shadows of high tragedy. The gifted Gilfillan in Waverley passes easily from the New Jerusalem of the Saints to the price of beasts at Mochlin Fair. Morse Hedrick, caught up in religious ecstasy, begs her son not to soil the marriage garment. Cuddy replies, a war, war, mother. If bleasin a war but marriage, and the job is how to win by hanging. Scott knew that without some such salt of the pedestrian, romance becomes only a fairy tale and tragedy a high heeled strutty. But a third gift is needed for a great imaginative creator. He must have a profound vision of life. Something which, in Keats's phrase, can tease us out of thought. He must have thought Walter Badger called a consecrating power. It is because I find this in Scott in the highest degree, higher than in any other English novelist, higher than in Balzac, as high as in Tolstoy and Dostoevsky at their best, that I feel assured of his immortality. He is the largeness and the rightness 
of the immortals. If I had to define his purpose, I should say that it was to inculcate reverence and godly fear. His aim is that of Greek tragedy, to secure a valiant acquiescence in the course of fate and in the dispensation of human life. To him, peace and fortitude are to be found only in a manly and reverent submission. But his reconciling power lies not only in his submission to the law, but in his joyous recognition of his soul of goodness. If he makes the world more solemn, he also makes it more sunlit. He is Shakespeare's gift of charging our life with new and happier values. The great novels enlarge our vision, light up dark corners, break down foolish barriers, and make life brighter and more spacious. If they do not preach any single code, they in Shelley's words repeal large codes of fraud and woe. Swinburne writes somewhere, finding in love of loving kindness light, and in that word loving kindness, we have Scott's secret. He makes us feel the pity of things, but also, strangely, the mercy. He has the insight of the healer and the reconciler. He loves mankind without reservation. He is incapable of hate, and he finds nothing created altogether common or unclean. He can penetrate to the greatness and the humble, and the divine spark in the cloud. It is through the mouths of humble people that he proclaims his evangel. It is not the kings and captains who most eloquently preach love of country, but Edie Ogletree, the beggar, who has no belongings but a blue gown and a wallet. It is not a queen or a great lady who lays down the profoundest laws of conduct, but Jeannie Deans, the peasant girl, it is Bessie McClure, a lone widow among the hills, who in the Covenanter's strife has the vision of peace through a wider charity. No other great writer, I think, has lived so close to the poor or done quite the same thing for them. They have expounded their pathos and their humors, and some have made them lovable and significant. But Scott, alone has lifted them to the sublime. Thank you. Mr. President, as the personal representative of His Majesty the King, I greet you most heartily in this ancient city, the Hilton capital, the first citizen of the United States. Canada, sir, welcome you not only for your own sake as an old friend, for I believe that you know well our Eastern 